For today's update, I want to draw your attention to recent happenings that, for the most part, have largely gone unnoticed under the radar. And the reason being is that America, and sadly, even the church in America, is more enamored and captivated by what's happening with a couple like Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. Oh, seems like somebody uh, knows what I'm talking about here. Meanwhile, there are major prophetic manifestations, if I can say it that way, and they have profound ramifications that no one's paying attention to because of what their attention is on. At the risk of being sort of discombobulated, I'm going to have you put this couple in your hip pocket uh, and we'll come back to it at the conclusion. And here's why. This Kanye West in particularly, as pictured here, is actually fulfilling scripture prophetically, which I'll take the time to expound on momentarily. Be that as it may, the recent happenings I'm referring to are in no way small potatoes. Uh, you have to have been in North Idaho to understand the uh, uh, phrase uh, small potatoes. <laughs> um, consider these headlines, all right? I'll go quickly. Yet another earthquake, this time in Eilat. This was the seventh earthquake in the span of one week in, of all places, Israel. That's Matthew 24, 7. Minister, 7,000 could be killed in major earthquake in Israel. Here's another one. Kerry holds urgent talks as U.S.-Saudi rift deepens over Middle East policy. Have you heard about this? Apparently Saudi Arabia has had it with the United States because of one phone call between the President of the United States and Rouhani of Iran. And they were under the impression that we were going to take action in Syria and didn't. And by the way, this is all about oil or if you understand Ezekiel 38, spoil. This is Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Sheba and Dedan or Saudi Arabia. Listen, this is right off the pages of Scripture. This reads like the pages of Bible prophecy. How about this one? Iran talks. Kerry didn't persuade Netanyahu. This is Ezekiel 38, 5. This is Iran listed by their ancient name, Persia. And there's this one, EU to relaunch membership talks with Turkey. Turkey is also in Ezekiel 38, verse 6, to Garma. How about this one? Gafcon, former spiritual powerhouses now hostile to Christian faith. This is 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, amongst others, about how in the last days it will be very unpopular to be a Christian. Syria, blast near Damascus, airport triggers blackouts. Is that not Isaiah 17? Murders at weddings and attempted assassinations. Is this what Egypt has become? Is that not Isaiah 19? Isaiah 19 tells us what's going to become of Egypt. I had someone mention to me and share with me how that I forget who it was. I have the memory of a gnat. That's all the drugs and drinking I did before I came to Christ. It killed so many brain cells. <laughs> Let me think here. Anyway, basically the gist of it was they had someone come to them and say, show me in the Bible where what's happening in the Middle East is prophesied. And oh my goodness, they took them right to Isaiah 19 and, and you know, eyes like this. Egypt, 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 Isaiah 17, Syria, 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 Syria. 
about this one? Israel strikes Hezbollah bound missile shipment. That's Psalm 83. How about this one? Abbas says he's ready to meet with Netanyahu. Yeah, right. That's Zechariah 12. Now, what if I told you that not only are these just a few of the headlines, but that they were all published within a 48-hour news cycle just last week. And that's just a few of them, by the way. I had to delete like a jillion of them to try to keep the teaching within a four-hour block. <laughs> but here's the thing. Even if you go back further than this 48-hour news cycle, what you find is even more exciting. Consider these previous headlines and just a couple of weeks back. Pope plans to visit Israel as early as next year. Is that not in keeping with the nine-month timeline that Secretary of State John Kerry gave? Abbas calls for peace and praises terror on the same day while they are saying peace and security, 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Palestinian president, listen to this, hopes to use pen from Pope to sign peace treaty, Daniel 9.27. Is everybody okay here? Daniel 9.27. I don't know how... You can't make this up. This is exactly what we were told by the prophets of old would come. It's coming. And this last one, Israeli strike coming. Netanyahu all but said, we're going to make a, a launch a preemptive strike against Iran. Uh, we happen to uh, take very serious when someone crosses a red line, unlike uh, other... Uh, anyway, I'll leave it there. Here's where I'm going with all this. The common thread woven into the fabric of these and all the other headlines were foretold in Scripture. In other words, the Bible gives us detailed descriptions of what the world is going to look like and be like right before the rapture. I believe that everything that is currently taking place in the world today is pointing to the soon return of Jesus Christ to snatch his bride away. It can come at any time. Nothing has to happen before the rapture happens. Damascus, Isaiah 17, does not have to happen. Isaiah 19 with Egypt. Zechariah 12, Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, at all. None of those have to happen before the rapture happens. Listen to what Jesus said, Luke 21, 28. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. John 14, 29. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. God doesn't want us ignorant concerning end times events. He wants us to know so that we'll be ready and believe. John 13, 19, he echoes the same thing. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Well, what did he tell us was going to happen before it happened? What are the things he said to watch for that when they begin to pass, that it meant that we were to look up because our redemption draws near well, I believe he told us that there would be many who would mock and ridicule and blaspheme. This is where Kanye West comes in. I need to go on record, and I appreciate your patience. We won't be much longer. I need to go on the record so as to str set straight the record. And listen to me. Kanye West, amongst all of the other musicians, rock bands, artists, if you want to call them that, without exception, have sold their soul to the devil. And they are demon-possessed. And if you think that's ridiculous, and it's just a gimmick, then please, you are to be pitied. And you are to be prayed for, because you have been deceived. These people have sold their soul to the devil for all the fame and the sex and the drugs and the rock and roll and the money that they could ever want. 
This is a demon-possessed man. And his demonic possession... I need to calm down just a little bit here. This is how I came to Christ, by the way, at age 19. I was heavily involved in satanic music. And I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and I knew he was real because I knew that Satan was real, and I knew that Satan was real because of the music I was into. And I figured if Satan is real, that means Jesus has to be real. And here's the thing, why are all of these musicians and these rock bands blaspheming Jesus? Why aren't they blaspheming Muhammad? Let's be an equal opportunity offender here. Why aren't you blaspheming Buddha? Why aren't you dressing up somebody like Buddha or, you know, I could be Buddha, I, you know, and bring him up on the stage? Why is it Jesus? Pictured here is evidence of his satanic obsession by way of his demonic possession in mocking Jesus Christ yet again. And it's not the first time. He has an album bearing the title, Jesus. This was in Seattle last weekend, by the way. Man dressed up like Jesus, walks up on the stage, only to be met with his fans shouting. I almost can't utter the words. Jesus is whack. This is Second Peter 3, verses 3 through 7. He says in the last days they're going to mock your Jesus. They're going to scoff your Jesus and his return. They're going to follow evil desires. But it's verse 7 that keeps me sane. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. You know what keeps me sane from not losing my mind? Is knowing that a fiery judgment is reserved for this ungodly and wicked man and all those who mock my Jesus in a satanic antic like this. I just have to, like Psalm 73, see their end. When in the end, the psalmist would say, when I entered the sanctuary of the Lord and I saw their end, and in the end, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that my Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You will mock Him no more. And by the way, when my Jesus comes, He's not going to come riding a donkey. And He won't come standing trial. And He won't come dying on a cross. He's going to come blazing as God Almighty. You'll see. You'll see. I'm not pointing at you. I'm sorry. You're going, whoa, hey, wait. Revelation 1 gives us a description of what it's going to be when he comes back. I can't wait, by the way. Hey, we're going to be there, you know. At the rapture, he comes for us. At the second coming, he comes with us ten thousands by his side as his bride. I can't wait. I'm actually asking for reservations for a front row seat for certain. He comes in the clouds. His eyes are fire. And these Kanye Wests are going to fall to their face in terror. Why don't you all stand? I'm going to close today's update by just sharing with you something the Lord has put on my heart in recent days as it relates to Jesus tearing. Especially when I see stuff like this, I think, man, God, you see what they're doing? What, like God isn't up there going, when do they do this? 
I know that's dorky, but that's how I think. Let me preface this by just kindly asking you to please not let the enemy distract you so you tune me out. I really need for you to hear me out, especially if you're one who is in the midst of a trial right now in your life. Maybe you're going through some very, uh, you know, diff hard difficulties, financial difficulty, marriage difficulty. Maybe it's a, a medical uh, difficulty. But you are currently tasting from the cup of suffering. And you're, you're losing heart. And the Lord isn't coming back. And you, you thought he would come back by now. And you've been waiting for him to return for many years. Here's what the Lord ministered to me. It was just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Just because the Lord didn't come back when you thought he would or could, some of us thought he was going to come back in the 70s. Some of us the 80s. By the way, I'm so glad that he didn't come in the 70s because I didn't get saved till the 80s. <laughs> just saying. But he still hasn't come. And so here's the enemy saying, you, you, you think it's going to be in your lifetime? He, has, he hasn't come. Where's the promise of his coming? He's not going to come. He's not coming soon. He didn't come back in the 70s or the 80s. So here's the question. Does that mean that his return is further away or does it mean that it's closer to home think that through with me just because the Lord didn't come back when you thought doesn't mean he's not going to come back when you least expect it Jesus said I come at an hour you expect not one last thing and I'll close with Proverbs thirteen twelve, and I appreciate your patience we always quote the first part of this, but not the second. Listen to the first part. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You lose heart when a hope is deferred or delayed. But, listen, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. That's the rest of the story. <laughs> okay, one last one. This will be the last, last one. This is interesting. I was thinking about, you know, how the analogy of a, a woman in labor, you know, that the coming of the Savior will be like a woman travailing in labor. You know, the birth pains will come in greater intensity and shorter frequency. Well, listen to what Jesus said in John 16, verse 21. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But, and there's the but again. When her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that the child is born into the world. Ladies, you know exactly, you know, us men, we only know by proxy, right? Well, what's my point? Here's my point. Right now, it's the birth pains. And it's painful. It's painful. And it's hard. Soon and very soon, we're going to eat from that tree of life. That longing will be fulfilled. And the joy that will come will wash away the tears from our eyes by the very hand of the Savior himself. I never assume that there are not people in the church that I have such a profound privilege to pastor that didn't bring with them some really tough stuff, some really heavy and weighty things. And I want to encourage you today as we close in prayer to cast all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. For me, I have to give Him my anger. I've confessed to you that I have in the past struggled with anger. Uh, I try to couch it, you know, as spiritual anger, you know, righteous anger, but 
The Lord doesn't let me get away with that. <laughs> but I just have to bring my anger and my frustration and my, you know, to him and just lay it at his feet. And don't sneak back in this afternoon, you know, two o'clock before kickoff and try to take it back. Leave it here today, will you? Pastor, I'm, our marriage is hanging on by a thread. <laughs> Put your marriage at the foot of the cross and leave it there. Put Jesus Christ back in the center of your marriage and leave it there. And I promise you, on the authority of God's word, he'll heal your marriage. He'll heal your marriage. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can come to you as we are in all of our brokenness and that you will fix us and restore us and make us whole. Thank you, Lord, that knowing we have the rapture to look forward to makes whatever we're going through in this life easier to get through, knowing that soon and very soon that longing will be fulfilled, that trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet you in the air. Lord, come quickly. Maranatha, in Jesus' name, amen.